Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's event. Um, I will start by introducing myself. Uh, most of you might not know me. Um, I'm fairly newer to UXRS, um, but uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the social media director for UXRS, and um, it is my first time hosting an event, so bear with me uh, if there's any technical difficulties or, or anything like that, if I stumble a little upon the way. Um, but before we go ahead and get started, I'll just share um, some brief announcements before we get to the main event. Oh, if it loads, okay. Awesome. So, um, so tonight we're here for an ode to co-creation, and we're really, really excited to have John Sarmiento with us here today, um, and really excited to get to that. Before we do, um, we just have a wide variety of social media channels that we're on, um, so please do go follow us. Uh, Mallory will put a link in the chat uh, to our link tree. And that has um, the links to all of our platforms. Um, and all of these platforms, we post uh, content, resources, um, news, and new events that are coming up. Um, we have monthly events. So, uh, so do follow us to get uh, to stay tuned for all of that. And for next month's event, we have Amanda Stockwell who will be um, talking about UX research in an agile world. So you can actually scan the QR code here um, with your phone to get your ticket on Eventbrite now. Uh, we'll also put a link in the chat um, for the event as well. It's on September 28th at 5 p.m. CDT. So we'd love to see you all there as well. And your feedback is really, really important to us, and you really help determine the way, the direction that all of our events go. Um, so we will have a follow-up survey. We'll post the link in the chat towards the end of the event, and the survey will also be sent out uh, via an email afterwards. So please, please fill out the survey because you really help drive all of our events. Now coming to tonight's event, we're thrilled to have John here with us. Uh, he's a lead UX researcher from Caraloop, and he'll be uh, here to discuss the co-creation process with us tonight. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to John. Ooh, howdy y'all, give me one sec. I'm gonna go and share my screen. Yeah. Damn. Do y'all see it? Yes. Awesome. Well, happy Thursday, everyone. Welcome to my presentation, an ode to co-creation. To celebrate this method, theory, some case studies, but I'm just here to nerd out. So to start off, a quick introduction about me. I'm John Sarmiento. I receive he, him, his pronouns. I like bears beats Battlestar Galactica, and I love board games, bread, and botanical gardens. My office is full of plants, and that's a hobby I picked up in the past year, so it's something I'm quite proud of. But other than my other hobbies, I am a lead UX researcher at Caraloop in Dallas. We better understand the role of caregivers, and how can we better make, how can we make caregiving more enjoyable for everyone? And my background is in medical anthropology and in public health. I got my master's in, at UN, University of North Texas Health Science Center and UNT in Denton. Um, other than my background, one thing I'm definitely not is a co-creation expert. I'm here today to share what I love about co-creation, how I see the connection of this thought process in my current practice as a UX researcher, and something to share and think about as we explore uh, our crafts as people who want to be researchers or be strategists or be human-centered designers. So without further ado, let's, let's jump right in. So first of all, what is co-creation? 
Well, a series of design researchers, Pillar et al, kind of defined it as uh, co customer co-creation is an active, creative, and social process based on collaboration between the producers, retailers, and users that is initiated by the firm to generate value for customers. So this is a very broad term and use it across like the industry, but some uh, a common question I typically get is like, is co-creation a method or a theory? Is it a kind of a binary? Is it one or the other? Well, my response is yes, <laughs> it kind of is both. My hot take is that co-creation is as much a learning, learning ideology as it is a methods toolkit. It emphasizes the collaborative role of the collective other in a, in a project's creation process, all towards a shared goal. And their involvement can be at specific points, such as the data collection parts, or embedded throughout the project's life cycle. And so with some of the things that we, uh, as a researcher, things I think about, things to include in a co-creation project, I lean into my toolkit as a UX researcher. One overarching umbrella toolkit tool is a workshop facilitation knowing how to manage a group of people, how to facilitate discussions and present uh, a way to have a sense of inclusion and have people excited about what they're sharing their ideas about. Other aspects are in-depth interviews, storyboarding, narratives. Narratives can be something where participants write their, their perspectives or create a story through images, kind of like with storyboarding, or even doing a, a video ethnography of themselves and showing their physical space and becoming the filmmaker. Uh, other aspects of co-creation could even be diary studies, uh, role-playing, body storming, constructing and modeling with objects of abstract concepts or a service journey, prototyping, prioritization mapping and planning, as well as a, perhaps a more common example in the industry I've seen is crowdsourcing. So having a little bit of, of using your massive audience to kind of help shape the direction of, the, uh, of these designs and creations. So why consider co-creation? It's to imagine possible futures that are informed and resonate with your customers. Co-creation activities can keep your team informed and close the gap between the business and customers. And ultimately, it aims to build trust and stickiness with the product, service, and brand. One consulting company, uh, Iris, developed this index called the Particip Participation Brand Index, where they brought in various global uh, like thought leaders and businesses and evaluated how involved they were with participatory methods in the design process. And from what from their study, uh, as mentioned here, a three-year investment in the top 20 global brands in the participate, the PBI would have earned a return four times that of the bottom 20 brands. And an investment in the top 10 brands in the index would have produced double that for uh, of the S&P 500 each year over the past three years. So there is something to say about the incorporation of a co-creative process in bringing in uh, your customers into thinking about new possibilities or revealing those gaps that were always there, but maybe the business hasn't really found the, the value of pursuing what customers actually want. So this all sounds great. There's a lot of like fun things at a high level about what co-creation is, but here's some common challenges with it. Uh, sometimes the outputs where participants, the things that they create at the end may not be generalizable to the larger uh, audience, as well as it may not be readily scalable to design and develop. Uh, one example, as you can see here, is the, uh, that uh, parable of Homer Simpson being the one user and designing a, a car for himself. Uh, sometimes these creations uh, that occur in these co-creation workshops can be very like left field, so many different ideas and parts, and it may not feel like it's a, a viable product to build and, and make. But I'll get into uh, kind of the counter argument for that for this type of process. But that's definitely one thing to consider and something that as 
researchers or, or design human-centered thinkers, if this is a process we are interested in doing, we have to find a way to convince those who are skeptical or unsure about if this is something worth doing. The second part of this is that uh, sometimes co-creation workshops, they're tough because facilitation is tough. I'm not sure how many of y'all participated in a, like a focus group or a group workshop or even actually facilitated, not just being a participant, but there's a lot of like social dynamics that occur during that, those activities where sometimes there's a, a very dominant figure in the group session who commandeers the conversation. Sometimes people are not as active, perhaps they're not unsure of what to do, or maybe they're just not really digging the process. They're just sitting there. So there's a lot of that like uh, common uh, researcher uh, awareness that needs to go on during those workshops, especially when things can be very speculative and out of the ordinary, out of the ordinary when people work together and create something. And lastly, this point is something that I uh, take to heart is that how can co-creation projects maintain uh, accountability within the team to your customers and users? And how do you maintain that the participants trust after the project ends? Like for instance, if you design a cool idea, but it doesn't, uh, you gather insights from your, uh, from your participants, you eventually uh, produce it into the real world, but it doesn't actually meet their expectations or perhaps the solution presented a new problem to, uh, to your customers and users. How does your project team prepare for that uh, potential consequence and maintain that trust along the way? Because again, it can affect the brand relationship as well as, you know, as a researcher, there's that existential crisis of like, I, I don't want to cause any harm. <laughs> so those are uh, some of my high level thoughts about what co-creation is. Now let's talk about some ingredients. So aspects of co-creation, I call this a snack size review. This is an inexhaustive uh, list of things that what make co-creation a thing. Uh, I'm, taking, I'm pulling some aspects from things I learned in academia, things I've learned from the industry practices, but without further ado, I'll just jump right in. So with co-creation, it requires a constructivist mindset. So for those unfamiliar with this concept of constructivism, it's the value of finding understanding the social phenomena among the people that you're trying to understand. Uh, so it's exploring the many knowledges across people. And it has the, and with this approach, it recognizes participants as, uh, as like the experts of themselves, their lived experiences, their, the impact, the perceived impact of their surroundings, the culture, belief systems. How does that uh, become a useful insight for the project team to analyze and help decide what direction to do in terms of facilitating a design. And it, again, it leads into uh, understanding the worldview context and sense-making. Sense-making meaning how does a individual logic find a logic in the way that they experience the world? And getting into those like nuances, those cultural uh, mental moments is, is the sweet spot of what co-creation uh, tries to reveal. And a quote by uh, David Alkind, a the classic education psychologist, kind of defi defines it as, uh, constructivism is the recognition that reality is a product of human intelligence interacting with experience in the real world. As soon as you include the human mental activity in the process of knowing reality, you have accepted constructivism. So uh, in terms of research epistemologies, constructivism is kind of, some say like the opposite of positivism, the more of the empirical research, the more of the what's rather than the why's. And as a uh, qualified researcher, uh, as a experienced researcher, you get to see and understand the value across these different research perspectives. But with co-creation, it leans into this multiple knowledges of your participants and recognizing the patterns that exist within them. The second part of co-creation, I like to think, is the intentional collaboration and vulnerability aspect, where as a researcher or a project team member, it's, it's valuing the positioning of the participant as an active stakeholder throughout the process. So in other words, it's making sure that 
the people that you're trying to understand have actual stake in defining what the designs and creation process looks like. And the, the level and degree of their of the participants involvement depends on the project. That's a common, <laughs> a common uh, phrase in the UX world is it always depends. But in co-creation activities, the purpose of these tend to be giving up that power of a researcher as the observer to those who you're observing. And it values the creative agency and identifies participants as creative beings, that they're the, they're the people that can really make something happen, as opposed to, you know, being kind of like snobbing and saying, oh, that, that design isn't good, <laughs> they don't know. So uh, I think having that kind of mental switch in the identity of the a participant is an interesting challenge, but it's something to embrace throughout the process of co-creation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, facilitation is key in these discussions, recognizing when and how to uh, establish your role as like your, their other uh, and making sure that you mitigate any power dynamic imbalance. <laughs> so like making sure you're not like fully leading them or uh, evaluating their thought, thought process or creative process. Uh, here's this visual that kind of kind of demonstrates the different uh, ways the relationship between their participants are with the projects. So as you see here on, the, on this X, Y axis, you have the ownership versus the openness. So, well, yeah. so with the small circles, those are like you would say they're participants. So in some co-creative activities, you have people uh, informing, the, uh, informing the, the project team. They may not necessarily have involvement in defining what your research questions are or what the goals are, but that's kind of leaded, that's kind of led by the project team. Uh, sometimes you have your uh, specific panel of experts, like your SMEs, who are involved in that project definition phase uh, and also the data collection. But the more you move right, the more decentralized or a uh, it can be more decentralized or more, uh, more reliant on the camaraderie of your participants. So what I mean by that is uh, in the top right, you see this community of kindred spirits. So this is kind of a synonymous to crowdsourcing where your participants may not have you know, a direct involvement of a project, but they, uh, their interactions with each other help shape the project without being led. Um, I'll get, I'll get into another example later on, but uh, think of it as, again, a community of kindred spirits. Um, and lastly, this coalition of parties. Uh, one example of this would be, let's say if you wanna do a co-creative project with departments within your company or organization, where everyone has a unique set of skills and stakeholders, but they're all working collaboratively together to better understand how to improve internal processes. Like there is a collective uh, stake in the game that what, what we do, everyone else is involved with because we're in the same, uh, we're in the same company. So the reason why I show this is that there are many ways where a, a co-creation activity can be positioned in a way where your participants are involved in the project making process or uh, how do they involve themselves in the creation of these ideas. And so this is the fun part, I think, of co-creation. It's the social interactions with convivial tools. Convivial tools are tools that are, uh, as Ivan Illich, he's a person that coined it, um, they are those which like, give each person who uses them the greatest opportunity to enrich the environment with the fruits of his or her vision. And these materials, for the sake of this discussion or this uh, presentation, it's basically the materials that participants use to engage with. It facilitates and elicits discussions, collaboration, conflict. And through this, it emerges ideas and social phenomena based off of the thing that they're trying to display to the researcher and also with each other. And some elements of this, it's embracing the play of it all. It may at first for participants feel very loose ended. Uh, they can be given a set of tools, whether it's 
markers, paper, cutouts, toys, and kind of leaning into the, the theory of play, how do, you, uh, how do you provide your participants with this sense of this playful spirit where they can create and display an experience, not only uh, to demonstrate within themselves, but also just demonstrate across other people? And how do they as a collective play off each other's ideas? And so this is where the fun chaos occurs whenever you're doing these activities. It's like there's a, there's a sense of agency and a sense of collectiveness. And as a facilitator, uh, it's important to probe why things make sense. You know, uh, when, as a researcher, whenever I observe a, like a usability study, I, I like to know like, why do they wanna choose this button uh, versus the other? Like I, I probe for like their mental model, model models of how do they go through a flow. That kind of process is almost analogous to what occurs in these co-creation work sessions where as they're designing and then sharing their process of what they created, uh, as a facilitator, I would explore, you know, why did you say that this block is a five inches away from this other block? How, why is this, uh, the colors of this, you know, a, a collage versus this one was just a solid color of things. And uh, in theory, understanding these nuances of how people think can reveal what, uh, potential new patterns of thinking in informing your designs. So I guess kind of what that may look like is something like this, where uh, in a workshop, you can have team, uh, your participants have a set of tools, in this case, Lego blocks. How do they kind of contribute into this role playing of a scenario? And th through these conversations, you get to see how one's mental models kind of adds on or conflicts with how they perceive uh, an experience. So um, uh, this was from uh, Unsplash, uh, so like that open source <laughs> photo uh, uh, repo. But I like to think, I, I think this is an example of how other team members are working together to kind of create a, a new design of how, um, how to create this interesting stage of theater, blocks interacting with each other. You see all these little tubes connecting. Uh, looks like they are, they're all unique places. So as so, if I were facilitating this discussion, I'd be kind of asking, okay, so why are things uh, kind of connected to this one thread? When, do, when does one piece interact with other pieces inside? And so when I hear one person's explanation of their thought process, I leave it open to see if there's anyone else who also had similar experiences uh, with their building uh, this co-creation. So this was a, kind of a lot, very, a little bit esoteric, but these are elements to think about when you dive into the uh, co-creative workshops, is that you allow the participants to have fun, like they, or have fun or allow them to be creative, liberate themselves from feeling like they can only do so much, uh, in terms of what they think and feel, and ultimately have a nice collage of ideas. <laughs> so here are some uh, key things of planning out a, uh, a study. So I adapted this from Lisa Groka. She's a uh, design researcher from the Emerging Technologies uh, Institute over in New Zealand. And I think these can help frame what to think about of how to uh, how to plan for a goal across your team, uh, how to think about the timing of your projects. And I think these are essential for anyone that's trying to execute a research project. So planning it out. But typically, it always starts out with a research objective. So in a co-creation workshop, are you purely designing it for gathering insights? Are you trying to just find uh, find patterns across ways of thinking? Are you trying to generate ideas that be, uh, that meaning, are you just trying to see what are these different individual or collective experiences and creations that your participants make? So basically having a catalog of these ideas and perhaps something in between called sense making where it's, you see how their creations are made and understand why they made it that way. Uh, another important aspect is this decision-making authority. Um, 
So is you as a researcher and your project team, is the out, do you, who makes the final decisions on the designs? And are you more of acting more of a consultant? Will you take whatever your uh, participants make and then decide you are the decider? Or is it more community led? Is it up to the participants to make the final decision of what goes forth and what is worth iterating? Or is there a balance between the two? It's more of this collaborative nature of uh, maybe talking about what are the business objectives from you as a consultant to this community or of this user group and what, uh, what do these participants value most and prioritize? So kind of having that, that collective balance between the two. Uh, it's important to define outputs. So in co-creation activities, uh, are you trying to create artifacts? Are you trying to develop artifacts of authentic use cases of how do they interact with the, uh, an experience? Are you looking for potential affordances? So finding uh, ways where a user can interact with something new. And also perhaps is something more broad, like what is this shared collective vision uh, that unites, like a message that helps unite or creates like a North Star for future projects? And what are the outcomes? So outcomes meaning what is like the long-term impacts that you hope to have from these activities? Some of these can be something that's like, hopefully it can be a successful solution. It actually solves a problem that was brought up during a uh, during the workshop. Uh, resilient commitments. So yeah, how, through this process of collaborating with each other as a project team with your participants, uh, how do you ensure uh, and strengthen the value of this activity and the outputs outputs from these activities. And in some cases, co-creation uh, allows for being connecting with other groups of people and understanding the role of these uh, of these different disciplines or different uh, roles, whether it's policymakers, uh, uh, other professionals. Uh, even your team members, how do you kind of collectively work together and establish that sense of vulnerability that goes along with these activities? Um, and lastly, for this last slide is kind of like a, other additions with social purpose. How do you uh, how do you develop a shared mutual learning process of complex issues, whether it's you know messy, cultural, political, uh, pragmatic, like what are some challenges and common roadblocks like you as the researcher have versus <laughs> what participants uh, typically go through in their day-to-day. -day. Sometimes it's embracing the empowering your participants. So for instance, if uh, you're pop the population that you're trying to better understand, perhaps they may be a, a population who may be disenfranchised, how do you, uh, how, how might you create a sense of empowerment in their way of using design to help absolve uh, challenge that, challenges that they face day to day that maybe I, I as a consultant can't achieve for them. Um, lastly, it's also building consensus, making sure that making sure ultimately there's alignment across uh, all members involved. And then lastly, it's more of a kind of a tactical thing. It's like the frequency of engagement. So is this uh, co-creative activity, is it a one and done kind of thing? Is it just one long workshop? Is it episodic? Is it um, do you have a, a, a different workshop over a, over a span of like two or three years over every other month? Or sometimes it's iterative where it's kind of episodic, but it kind of builds, uh, the designs and co-creation are built off of each other uh, over each session. So those are all the planning aspects of what goes into a creative uh, process. It helps, I think for me as someone that loves to like plan for research, it helps me think about, okay, how, how can I plan ahead in thinking about recruiting, how to prepping, preparing my team and community and helping to find how do we be vulnerable as observers uh, in this co-creation process? Um, how do we, I guess, build uh, confidence in this project with internal stakeholders? Because with research, it's it's inherently political. What do I mean by political? It's uh, sometimes to get a research project <laughs> uh, into the world, sometimes you have to demonstrate its value. Sometimes you have to uh, ensure that it has, has it uh, an immediate impact. So it's it's 
having these uh, things in the back of your head when planning out a code creative study can be helpful in making it happen and keep your research plan focused too. So uh, I also have some case studies. So less about some of these semantics of planning. Let's look at some fun images. So with Lego, um, in the late 2010s, uh, Lego wasn't doing so hot. They're, they had declining revenues and they had layoffs. And they needed a new growth strategy. And they because they recently had a line of products that had digital co components that was a required part of the experience of some of their Lego sets. Um, it turned out it wasn't as desirable as, uh, as what they uh, what they expected. And it also added complexity of how uh, many of its loyal uh, customers who use Legos, uh, that wasn't how they thought of using Legos. And so, uh, and even on the service operational side, there were some inventory and delivery issues as well. So there was a lot of compounding factors <laughs> of some of the designs that they thought would work, but didn't really uh, pan through. So, after this, Lego did a co-creation experiment where they implemented a low-risk, low-cost approach with rapid prototyping. Uh, the customer feedback was also on a small scale, and they launched a complimentary website, as you see here, Lego Ideas, where customers shared and voted customer-created content they wanted to see through their social media channels. So with this example, it's a little bit different from the things that I explained earlier, but this is one of the uh, this is a success story of how uh, a company can gather insights of allow while allowing their participants to make something that isn't fully guided, but allows that creative process to flourish and then share. And in all, uh, this helped directly inform how Lego could approach their product line and offerings, as well as uh, having this viral community building moment. So as you see here, you have uh, on this website, uh, you can submit ideas of, like to Lego. So there's that creation of coming up with these themes and concepts. There's contests, so there's a level of interactivity. So it still allows this, uh, this participant to engage with this brand and product with other people and have this kind of competitive element and as well as, and so uh, as you see here, just like there's a social media element where there's Get to see how many people are following it, or as well as how many days left are in a competition. So there's this gamification element as well that added on to this experience of co-creation. So some fun examples I found. <laughs> one of the themes of the contest was go minimal. Uh, one of the lead ones I saw were the infinity gauntlet, which is just the hand of a Lego. And another one was the hungry caterpillar, one of my favorite childhood books. Um, and also through this uh, active engagement uh, from LEGO's customers, they found uh, an interest in architecture. And this actually hit, uh, this actually informed uh, a different type of audience or it validated uh, that adults, uh, I think it was adults, uh, customers of LEGO uh, like this for its sophistication and its timelessness of the architecture of it. So gathering these insights by sharing and creating and uh, across like the larger group of uh, Lego customers kind of helps inform a business to think about what are some new ways of thinking instead of like creating uh, a line that had a, uh, there's an app that goes directly with your product or an app that goes directly with what you build. But there was more traction with this sharing competitive element as, uh, in their brand. Uh, another example of crew creation uh, like a, on a larger scale is IKEA. Um, so IKEA had a recent initiative where they were trying to uh, think of the future of what does a, a community uh, a community space, a, a retail space and a garden space could look like that is sustainable, brings in community and is enjoyable. So they uh, hired or partnered with uh, Inca, which is a, a design thinking kind of consultancy firm and to help them uh, do more of a crowdsourcing, but have a little bit more interactive elements of uh, within these design hubs. One of them being this exhibit where uh, participants would go through and 
kind of see and, and provide their reactions to how a space is molded or defined or some interesting features like as you see in the back there's some like there's plant elements with lighting um, and then from this immersive experience in these hubs they would provide these like uh, data inputs of doing like a vote system of these questions i wish i could read swedish but <laughs> what i can tell from here is that it it tries this data collection instrument is kind of uh defining what is a value of uh of these members who are who are interested in IKEA's vision of creating this uh, sustainable future of retail space or uh, retail housing and uh, garden. So there's many other like smaller examples, but uh, for the sake of time, I have this a quick activity for us. Um, so I I talked about elements of the planning part of co-creation. I talked about uh, the role of the researcher and allowing for discussions to happen within the creation process. I may not, not have gotten too much into details of uh, what people make as much. And I think this is where I want to experiment with this audience. I want to see how y'all create uh, a research project for yourselves for the, the small groups. So let me get some context for this activity, this little scenario. So keeping it relevant, I have this, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this example with this Amazon hub locker, but uh, it got some interesting uh, uh, responses from local community, community members in Chicago. Uh, if you notice the locker is placed on the pavement in a park. And it created some uh, conversation about uh, who has, like, uh, where, why was this place on the pavement? How, who was spoken to in the community about where to, where to place these? And so I thought it was, like, it would be an interesting design uh, thinking opportunity of how can we create a co-creative workshop around this idea of designing uh, walkways for a park. So what I have next is this quick project debrief. So what we'll be doing is we'll be putting y'all in different breakout rooms uh, with a group of like maybe six to 10 or so. And what I'd like for y'all to do is imagine this. Your stakeholders are interested in what could be redesigned about the sidewalk experience in your city's parks. Assuming you have funding, research materials and access to your audience, which are visitors at the park as well as your local park council um, you want to see how like what do does this audience think and do in these spaces to better inform what projects uh the the, the park the parks department can create that is meaningful uh for its for its uh, visitors so just for the uh the sake of this activity let's assume that you want to have some creative element where participants are provided a 2D map of the park, some toy blocks, toy people, construction paper, color pencils, scissors, string. It feels like a, you know, going back to elementary, which I love. I love <laughs> all those things, all these like uh, toys materials. But these are the things that we, you would like to incorporate in this co-creation process. Uh, participants are asked to use these materials to create experiences with walkways and public parks both individually as a participant, but also sharing with a group. So after we uh, split y'all into, into groups, I'd like for y'all to have a like a open-ended discussion about things that I brought up today about co-creation, what goes into it, how to approach projects like this as a uh, design thinking researcher, strategist, uh, designer, and think about some probing questions that you may want to ask participants when they're creating uh, a design for this park. Talk through some logistical and workshop facilitation challenges that you may experience. And then share ideas as if you were a participant and then collaborate on, and perhaps you can collaborate on some of uh, your designed experiences. Um, I probably should have mentioned, you know, if you have anything around you to like draw or uh, kind of use as a metaphor, 
of this uh, activity, feel free to use that if you want to do that last bullet point. But ultimately, what I want this activity to be is an opportunity for us collectively to think through what can make a co-creation process effective, and also how can it, uh, how can we think more critically of the people that we're trying to impact when we create think of design. So I've also included these little research constraints, um, kind of the things I mentioned earlier, but I kind of defined what each of these uh, research uh, points are. So the objective, you just want to create ideas, outputs, you want to understand use cases of these walkways and parks, and also have a shared vision. So if you were doing this project, what is your North Star to, uh, uh, to think about as you're designing for future projects? And with these outcomes, how do you build resilient commitments with uh, these visitors and also the partnerships? And have this, this the decision making authority go towards more of a community led approach. So, I kind of give a quick overview. Let me double check on time. How how am I doing, team? Doing all right? Okay. So, I have about ten to fifteen, or I'll, I'll say about uh, ten to twelve minutes. Well, is that, is, it, is that a good amount of time? Back any time. So, all right. You, let's give them enough time to get through enough of the exercise yeah 12 then, minutes yeah 12 minutes good and uh, at this time if anyone wants to screenshot this presentation slide go for it as a reference i'm not sure if this is transferable when you're in breakout rooms but use this as a guide um, to facilitate discussions so all right all right so i'm going to open up the breakout rooms and uh please go to where it picks you to go to because if you don't go someone will be missing you all right, so I hope there were some interesting discussions. Uh, one thing about this whole like research design process, especially something that uh, is supposed to elicit creative thinking and, and making, it can get quite messy <laughs> at times. And so for, I kind of wanted to spend the next like few minutes just, you know, I'd love to hear what things emerge from your discussions. You can put it on the chat. You can share it out loud, but I, I guess I'm I'm the facilitator. What's what what did, what did it, what happened? <laughs> so I think that um, part of the issue is making sure that everybody is understanding the same scope for what we're trying to do. Because in our group, there seem to be a number of differences in whether we're really addressing a whole park or if we are just trying to work on a walkway through a park. Yeah, now scaling can be quite interesting in these co-creation workshops because uh, there are some cases where you want to focus on a particular goal, but sometimes that goal can just be you know, is it a systems level issue or is it something that's very specific to a sidewalk like as y'all mentioned but yeah did anyone else have that kind of uh thought uh, in y'all's y'all's group just like we, figuring out what's had, the right thing to target we had the same exact thought and then we reread the brief and we realized that we had already had the funding from the city and oh. that they were on board with us to co-create and so then once we realized that we already had the resources and, and we were past the convincing stage of like where the monetary backing comes from, we could focus on the user. And then we started to drill down into like, how, how do you not obstruct their time? You know, like those parks, the original purpose of parks is to be an outlet for people, especially in city environments. So do we fill these with like a billboard type thing? How do you get community gardeners that have volunteered to plant plants? And keep, you know, you, you see these cell phone towers that look like trees, you know? Do you put billboards there that look like the vegetation that has already been built around community volunteers. Um, so we started to drill down into that once we went back and reread that we've already convinced the city that they're on board with it and we had the funding. 
but we originally started out with like, how do we convince the city? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, yeah. And so we, we thought about the, the workshop um, starting off. So we thought we could do some um, like some investigate some prior investigations to go and actually do observational like in context observation about what's happening in those parks, how people are using them. If it's a particular park, then like just to kind of have an understanding about how it's being used currently, what kind of people are going there. Um, and then at the beginning of the session, uh, get a greater understanding about how the participants actually use parks and you know what what they're trying to do by going there. Like what, what are their kind of needs around that? So to get a kind of like a bit of the, kind of like the idea of the beginning of a design sprint um, where you have that kind of, um, first it's an understanding about the problem and the situation and then we we let people go in and do their sketches and prototypes um uh, and then the idea when they were presenting so, so that we'd let people do their their design process and then either in groups or, or individually and then um the idea was to for them they had to go and then pitch like they, they had a role play where they'd be pitching their idea to the local government um, and anybody else who wasn't pitching would be the local government asking them questions about their idea and, and why and why it is. So we'd, we'd, it wouldn't just be the um, facilitator asking the probing questions, but it would be the whole group asking those questions as if they were evaluating that proposal for the local government. That was the way. It's a very cool example. Of, uh, good. Like in terms of having, like empowering that sense of uh, agents of being an agent of change in the process of the designing way, whether you're talking about policy, how do you, how does the community kind of work together to like iterate ideas or define a problem, iterate ideas, and then present it to potentially make an impact. So yeah, and I think from uh, the, per, uh, the, the previous example, when y'all were like drilling down all these different solutions, uh, sometimes that's part of the uh, co-creation way where it's uh, you kind of have to leave it a little bit open-ended to see like, where where do individuals prioritize or what are their top of mind ideas of reacting to this problem and then allowing the and allowing those discussions to happen across like you know is it is it like the advertisements that occur in the, in the park experience is it how do they walk through the experience is it just for exercise or if it's for you know just a leisure um i think there was another interesting point about uh doing preliminary research, whether it's contextual inquiry, eth ethnographic methods of interviewing and that element. So there is, in, in some of the co-creation uh, projects, there is a, uh, a preliminary phase of better understanding the context so that maybe those questions to help frame what are the solution, what are their proposed problem or pr the proposed solutions or the existing problems that exist, are the things that actually exist or the these things that we're just assuming like, hey, this is a problem participants figure it out. <laughs> so uh, I think that there's a lot of great points that came up in these uh, chats. Does, did anyone else have any other um, interesting tidbits from y'all's discussion? Yeah, I think like one of the things that we kind of discussed about in our group was like in this workshop, who would, who would the participants be? Um, do we get people from the council? Well, I'm from Australia, so we call them council people. Um, do we get like, and obviously get the people that's actually using it, so the community, but also getting like the delivery guys, because, you know, there might be like logistical issues that we need to solve in terms of like where this hub is going to be. Um, so there was definitely a fairly big discussion about you know, the type of participants as well. Um, definitely about the use of the space. So understanding the use of the space in terms of these groups of people, what do they see this space being used for? How do they use it? And in future, are there any other planning for, for this particular space? Um, and then thirdly, you know, having a bit of fun with like toy blocks and stuff, getting them to create like a park where it could be um, a little bit more functional and rec recreational as well. And then from there, we can actually start probing, hey, um, why was it designed this way? Why was it built this way? Um, because we have like a, a quite a diverse group of participants, you know, they can start looking at like, oh, 
we didn't think about that. We didn't know about that. So um, having that empathy towards each group will be great as well. So that's kind of where we got to. We didn't generate any ideas, but that's kind of where our discussion were leading to. That was fabulous. I love hearing that. Really, I love the uh, thinking about the other service elements by other people who are using the space, not necessarily for enjoyment primarily, but uh, you mentioned like having like delivery people because that's part of like the larger biome of interactions of a space and with people. So that's a, that's a cool call out. Yeah, we um, in our group, you know, that was one of the first things we talked about was how would you recruit for this? And we focused certainly on end users. And we talked about how, you know, we would want the people that use the park for all different reasons uh, represented. We want the people, you know, who have pets, the people who are have pushing strollers around, have kids, the people who um, are in wheelchairs, the people who are bike, you know, riding bikes and all that kind of stuff. And, and then um, as we were talking more, um, you know, we said, well, gosh, you know, we, should we, we it, when we would structure this, would we intentionally put people with different uses and goals together up front? Or would we put maybe all of the people with kids together and all the people that like um, use people together to create their perfect walkway and then everybody share out and advocate and then mix up the groups and have them empathize with each other and try to create a shared vision around um, what a shared use uh, walkway would be. Um, so uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting discussions. Cool. Like, uh, I was going through the chat as well, like, um, see if there's any physical design during COVID. Oh, yeah. Um, one topic I wish I had more time to talk a little bit more about is how do you create a digital co-creation experience? And I had a slide uh, earlier, and I decided to admit it. Um, it was from a, a project I did over at over my job where we were learning this uh, collaborative tool. We were using, uh, I think, Figma. And we were bringing in other members who maybe not be them, uh, who may not be as active on digital software tools. And so we created a quick little sandboxy experience, kind of giving instructions of how to, uh, how to use it and allowing for play. Like if, you, if I were to share it, it'd be like, you see all these stickers, fun drawings. It looks like Microsoft Paint. <laughs> But the reason why I bring that up is that uh, the, using digital experiences to kind of create a co-creative space is interesting in terms of, is it accessible for your participants? Is it, uh, how familiar are people with using this, perhaps a new uh, way of interacting? Whereas if it was an in-person workshop, um, you have toys, physical, it's more interactive in that way where you don't have a digital uh, media medium to like interact with to convey it on a on a screen so there's that level of like difficulty curve that uh, a facilitator would have to consider and just with like with any workshop when when thinking about how to kind of build rapport early on not only with sharing the purpose of the co-creation workshop but making participants feel comfortable with the things that they're going to be engaging with for like an hour <laughs> so um uh, whether it is with toys saying, hey, we know these are toys, we acknowledge that, but we, won't, we hope for you to kind of play with it, have fun with it, learn with it, from, uh, and then even on a digital experience, like spend like 10, 15 minutes for your participants to get familiar, and it doesn't have to be fully structured in the way that you onboard them, uh, make it make them feel more comfortable uh, with this new tool that they may not, not be exposed to. So those are like small like things to consider when doing a co-creation exercise where you allow for this uh, the chaos to occur when things are creating, but you want to make sure that everyone at least somewhat starts in the same place of like, let's dive into the sandbox. <laughs> um, any other points? Um, let's see. Any other questions that maybe um, I didn't address in the presentation I can probably bring up? So I have two that came up in the chat earlier. And if you guys have more, put them in there. Um, one of them was how to prevent groupthink. Classic workshop challenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think that that is a skill um, just by reading the room, seeing how, uh, like with groupthink, 
for those who don't know, it's like when people add on to this one idea, perhaps if someone is very convincing to like follow this idea and everyone just wants to join because it sounds good or it's just, it, it, it primes the rest of the group to think that way. So as a facilitator, I think this is where the tactics of like probing can help at least help mitigate to allow other people to explain maybe why they agree with this idea or this concept and do the, the sense making uh, kind of questions saying like, uh, walk me through why you all like why you agree with this concept, like get a little bit to the details. And so that can be either a, that can be asked from the facilitator directly to the group to the individual, or even in a uh, using a tool or an instrument where it's like it has a like a box with a question saying kind of like logic your way through through each of these steps of like why you think away so it really flushes it it flushes out their thought process a little bit more and i think that's where the nuances come out whenever you're now analyzing these uh subjective <laughs> uh reactions to, this, to the question totally and another one that came up um, when you were talking about intentional collaboration is how is that different from workshopping or is workshopping a more general term for all the things? For me, I, I treat it as more of an umbrella term. Um, I think both are a little bit synonymous. I think workshops is that idea that there is going to be a group involved, um, you know, and it may not necessarily be like some like a focus group where it's like a kind of a, a two parties, the us and the other, us being the researchers, the project team, and the other as a, a people that you're observing and just getting information, but there's not much of a conversation that goes on. Um, whereas in workshops, it's, it, it offers that collaboration or just the curiosity of the, uh, of the facilitator to kind of let the participant kind of walk through their thought process. Um, but I think that a lot of that is shared with many, I guess, qualitative research methods, whether it's interviewing, kind of doing more of your probing, better understanding their perspective, um, even with a group facilitation, making sure that everyone at least tries to, you want them to be their authentic selves going in, um, and making sure that their opinions are not necessarily, I wouldn't say necessarily unique, uh, from like what everyone else is saying, but having them feel valued because one of for me one of the takes that I get the most out of with co-creation is having a place where you can hear or having the place where you can put your participants uh, and leverage them in being an active member in the process as opposed to being like oh I'm here just to collect a check or uh, just here just to hear what other people say and just nod my head but it's up to the facilitator to navigate that workshop <laughs> to make sure everyone's active and as, as much as they can in, in a comfortable and, you know, it's a, yeah, in a good way. <laughs> yes, I had to, focus groups aside, I ran focus groups in New York City one time. That was fun. <laughs> Talk about very strong personalities around the table. Um, all right, so we've got another question around um, making sure an individual's voice is heard, especially when you're doing remote collaboration. What insights can you offer on that? Oh, so with remote, um, I'm, if it's like a, so what goes to my head is like, is it the conversation and the interactions? Is it synchronous, asynchronous um, conversations? Can conversations occur within a, like solely in a chat, like a private chat with uh, members? Um, or uh, that's where you can use these other instruments, like having a sheet or a form that they can fill out on the side where each individual does that, where you find other avenues where they can communicate their ideas while not necessarily being someone that is uh, sharing uh, vocally, but you have other places digitally on this, let's say if you use it like Mural or Figma uh, or Miro, you have a place where people can still put ideas while let's say not, while not having them feel like they need to interrupt a ongoing conversation. And I think that's what those types of tactics in the analog experience, whether you're in a room, I think as a facilitator, the, finding ways where people can still contribute uh, while acknowledging different communication styles that it, uh, can exist in a workshop. Got it. All right. Um, two more that came through the chat. So when your audience is culturally disparate, and they have a lot of distinct ideas in the co-creation process, 
how do you how do you deal with that? Do you generalize? Do you individualize? How, how do you weigh those? So again, this kind of goes along with this constructive, constructivist approach when looking at uh, your data, is that um, if the output of the data is to uh, find generalizable uh, assumptions or uh, generalizable things, I don't think this type of project would do so well unless you have a very robust uh, system of having multiple types, uh, recognizing each of the like homogenous kind of groups and like uh, and you're screening and, and who's involved in each workshop, but rather it's really looking at the patterns of like how people think, more of the whys of uh, the conversations that occur and recognizing the diversity of thoughts and even the com commonality across those diverse thoughts. And then bringing it up as like, hey, this is an interesting social phenomena that's occurring and it perhaps is something worth exploring. So thinking about like as like a strategy, like next step, having those whys kind of laid out and having the team, like after, let's say, assuming in this project, the, uh, the participants aren't involved. It's just the team kind of synthesizing what they experience with these workshops. Identify all these whys and then kind of talking through what is worth diving into and maybe saving for later. Um, so I think there is a different kind of strategic output that comes from these workshops as opposed to kind of saying, oh, this will, this, this, this has a high correlation of this, uh, this type of way of thinking with, you know, this create collective design. But one thing that's also interesting with co-creation is that there, again, there's that collaborative element where it's, uh, you get to see the individual, individual, or you, you aim to try to find the individual's way of thinking, but also how that individual interacts with other people. So if you're really getting to the, nit the nitty gritty of uh, data collection and analysis in this qualitative uh, arena, recognizing those patterns are also can be very fruitful, like seeing how one mental model complements, contradicts, and understanding the why uh, in those interactions of ideas can create a new question that maybe is worth exploring. That is so true, so true. All right, so the last one from the chat was around stuffy business stakeholders who don't like games and don't want to play. What do you do when they don't want to get up out of their seat or they don't want to pick up the crayon and draw? So there's two ways of answering this. If it's one, you know, uh, getting buy-in prior to it even exists. Um, you know, I think if there's a point where you think your product or service isn't like is stagnating in performance or not really not really seeing any growth, I think that's an opportunity to explore new ideas, which um, as some of some of those uh, stats I kind of presented, how more like larger successful companies who are applying these participatory tools is seeing more growth in the past like 10 years as opposed to those who don't, who aren't implementing or doing more traditional approaches to research. But when it comes to having them, having internal stakeholders being participants, I think that's where uh, it can be from the warm up of you know, doing some practice activities, kind of walking them through. And even if what they create isn't necessarily the most uh, extravagant thing, I think that as a, as a facilitator, that's where you can continue like probing them, like walking them through like how they're thinking in this process and then invite them to kind of connect their thought process with other people. And then hopefully there is a, again, a, collect, a collective co-creation element in those conversations. Yeah, one of the things that I've done is pair, well, in the before times <laughs> where we, we got to go with each other around a table, I paired a designer with somebody who wasn't a designer. So it encouraged that designer to help draw literally draw what that other person was talking with them about. So this really helped when I was bringing in users who they were car dealership people. So they weren't sitting around the whiteboard drawing fun stuff. They were dealing with numbers. So they didn't even want to pick up their pen 
or pencil or anything. So having a designer sit with them at the table really, really helped. And that designer turned into the facilitator for the table, which helped me as the big facilitator because I didn't have to facilitate 20 people. I could just go around to each one of the different tables, which was helpful. Um, all right, so we've got a couple of people raise their hand for other questions. So we're gonna start with WKN. What question do you have? Yes. I was just wondering um, if the industry can come up with like a, a safety statement before every co-creation project, because it feels kind of, um, you know, to bring everyone to the same page. I mean, I know they do that with writing workshops. So why don't, why can't we come up with like a safety statement with design workshops, you know? Yeah, uh, could you elaborate more on like what, um, how safety statements are kind of applied? Um, I'm kind of curious about that. Is this like an NDA form? Is it kind of a statement of saying what you're saying is um, your participation is going to make sure we're, we're going to make sure that you're not going to experience any harm during or post? Like, um, yeah. So in in the writing workshops, we would say that oh, um, because this is a new. Uh, writing that you just did, we're not going to uh, criticize or we're going to just love what is so st strong in your writing because you just created it. Um, so I feel like in design workshop the same way because everyone's just coming together to, to do something um, and produce it at that moment that it should the criticism shouldn't be just like shut down or, or whatever that it should be more of a, a encouraging um, comments to bring it out, you know, um, and, and make it feel safer for someone to express themselves. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. Uh, again, uh, I think it, when it comes to bringing participants into this workshop, it's as a, as a facilitator, I want them to be the, as much as themselves as they are uh, me outside into it. And establishing those ground rules are crucial in setting the tone and expectations, and ideally maybe the quality of the output uh, from the activity. But yeah, creating that sense of you know, identifying what is criticism, right? Or the role is criticism. Is that part of the process? Is that something as a facilitator, we, or as, as a project team, we want to explore, like going to a more traditional design critique approach, or how, can, or provide them with the oh, one way is also providing them with. A, a list of conversational tools. Um, I know there's a list out there, but it's like saying, uh, it's like an ad lib of blank, like I don't understand this blank because blank, or it, it kind of frames the, uh, the conversation to be a little bit more constructive or coming from a place of neutrality as opposed to aggressive, <laughs> uh, saying, ah, this, this looks ugly. <laughs> but um, also one, uh, Fun technique I like to do is as a facilitator when I'm going into a room saying like hey I'm we're gonna be doing some creation stuff I am a terrible drawer like that like signaling that for me I'm not a great artist or anything and I will say my stuff looks like crap but hey I'm trying to the purpose of this activity is to kind of walk through why I was drawing and that's just something that I want to explore with the rest of the team is better understanding where they're coming from and it may not the demonstration may not fully be the idealized form, but it's exploring what what inspired that form. Gotcha. All right. So I think those were all the questions that we had for you, John. Do you have any other parting words of wisdom before we go into our networking breakout rooms? Well, just have fun. Um, hope, hopefully y'all gained something out of this. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a co-creation expert. I just want to share some things that I really appreciate about the process and, you know, keep these discussions going, you know, uh, this approach of being you know, human centered by putting that power from the researcher to your participants shouldn't be fully, shouldn't be like radical or, or, you know, uh, or anything, but it should really just remind ourselves how do we keep ourselves being human centered. And I think this is one approach to doing it. And this isn't the only solution, but there's other methods too. But use this as a part, put this in part of your philosophical research toolkit. 
it's not really, again, not really a method. It's a series of things in an idea of how you understand the social phenomena of the world. <laughs> but I had a great time. I hope, hopefully you all enjoyed today. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, John. Appreciate it.